Since the dawn of civilization, spies of every nation and culture have worked to infiltrate their adversaries and glean the information that will give their side the advantage. The stakes are sky high, the strategies varied and imaginative, and the ultimate sign of success is that no one ever even knew you were there. In each episode, we will explore the moral and ethical gray zones of espionage, where treachery and betrayal go hand in hand with cunning and courage. This is the Spycraft 101 podcast. Welcome to your clandestine classroom. This is episode number 38 of the Spycraft 101 podcast. I'm joined by Ian Townsend, a former investigative journalist with ABC Radio National in Australia. Ian is the author of two historical novels, as well as the nonfiction book Line of Fire, which tells an almost completely unknown and very tragic story about an Australian family executed for espionage by Japanese forces in the opening weeks of World War II in the Pacific. I invited Ian onto the podcast after reading his book because I knew it was a story that deserves to be told. Ian, I know you're a busy man these days, so I really appreciate you taking the time to talk with me today. From what I understand, even though the events that you cover in Line of Fire took place in early 1942, they were almost completely unknown until you uncovered them for your book, which was published just in 2017, right? That's right. Not long ago. Wow. So how did you find this story when, when no one else had for so many decades? Well, people had mentioned this family. There there have been a few books on Rabaul published over the years. Strangely, even though it's a very important battlefield, especially for the Americans, the Australians really haven't recognized it as such. It's been a bit forgotten over here. So a few books did mention this family, and especially the little boy who was executed. They called him Richard Harvey, but he's, he went by three different last names, and that was the tricky thing, trying to track him down. He had so many different names. But a long story short, I guess, I wanted to write a novel set in 1942 in Queensland, which is my home state, a big state of Australia, about two and a half times the size of Texas. It was American base during World War II, just after the America declared war, or Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. American troops started pouring in. There are about a million troops here in Queensland. So I was researching a novel set in that time because it was a really interesting time for, well, for people living in Queensland. All these new people coming in, there was a war on. I thought I'd set a novel in that time based on what happened. But as I researched, I discovered a lot of the Japanese attacks on Queensland came from this little town on a Pacific island called Rabaul in New Guinea. And New Guinea is just north of Queensland, Papua New Guinea now. It was New Guinea and Papua, they used to be separate colonies. And they were both once Australian territory. So during World War II, New Guinea was Australian territory. And that's a long, interesting story, the history of that place. But I was reading bits and pieces about an Australian family, as I said, that were executed. It was just briefly mentioned, almost a footnote in some of these books after the Japanese invaded Rabaul. And it was something I'd never heard of, so I thought, you know, I'll, I thought, right, I'll, I'll write a non-fiction book about this family. It was so intriguing. And I'd never heard of, you know, a little 11-year-old boy executed as a spy. I thought that was amazing. Um, and I wondered, really, why nobody else could tell me much about it. And, and it wasn't really, really known to anybody in Australia. So I started investigating the family called the Harveys, and I really hit a brick wall, as I said. The little boy was known by three different last names, and the father had actually changed his name. So when you stumble across that sort of evidence, it's very difficult to track down the truth. They changed their names for various reasons over time. As I said, Dickie had three last names. And, you know, what really happens just became a bit of an obsession. Espionage, war, you know, it's very hard sometimes to find the evidence when everybody's dead. I can imagine that seems like you really had your work cut out for you. So did you have any big, big discoveries or any big like aha moment there where you uncovered something that it was truly unknown up until that point? Yeah, well, it took a long time. I was researching through newspapers trying to find clues. And there was a, there's a, our National Library in Australia is in Canberra. And it happened to hold newspapers from Rabaul, the Rabaul Times, before the war. And so I searched through that through for the names. Um, and I went online and searched as well and eventually found relatives of Dickie Manson, the little boy, and discovered that his real name was Richard, uh, Richard Manson. So Dickie Harvey, he was called <laughs> when I first found out, but his real name was Manson. He's actually born to 
a man called, his father was actually called Gazmir. So it confused things a lot. I eventually tracked down one of Dickie's cousins, Lev McLean, who lives not really far from where I'm living now in Brisbane. And it was just real. I guess it was a real murder mystery because there was so much that was unknown. It was so difficult finding people who were still alive. This family was pretty much wiped out during the war. Most members were killed. There's a couple who survived. One of the brothers who was in Rabaul managed to escape. And I thought he'd originally died, but I, eventually I found out he lived, found wedding details, and discovered he had a daughter, and eventually tracked down the daughter. So that took, that took a long time. But once I found the daughter, of course, then everything opened up, because there were photographs, there were letters. But the, the other problem as well was the cousin, Bev, Dickie's cousin, didn't know that much because the surviving brother, one of the surviving brothers who was still alive until a few years ago, refused to talk about it. There was so much trauma involved, and I think that's one of the problems with a terrible event like this, is that a lot of people die, and those who survive are so traumatized, they don't want to talk. And you find that a lot with war stories, with wars. The relatives often don't know what happened to even the survivors, because the survivors, if they've witnessed horrible things, just often are too traumatized to talk about it. So that was difficult as well. I did manage to speak to Graham Manson, Dickie's uncle, eventually, and he did open up with a lot of information, but it was very difficult. He was really very upset and crying at different times as we talked. It, often it was the first time he'd spoken about these events. He wasn't in Rabaul, but he knew the story from his brother who also survived. And it was, you know, he, he, he lost most of his family, so very difficult. It's, it's hard to imagine, you know, I certainly haven't experienced any kind of trauma like that, but, you know, that saying time heals all wounds, but even 70 years later, approximately, like you're talking about, and this guy struggles to discuss something that happened in 1942. And I'm guessing this was what, like 2014 or 2015 or something that you were talking to him probably? That's right. Yeah, exactly. So about 70, 75 yeah. years later. Yeah. And time doesn't heal grief yeah. often and trauma. It just goes on forever. You can deal with it, I think, and compartmentalize things, but something like this, the horrific events in Rabaul and, and, you know, eventually finding out what happened to your relatives, but not really knowing. I think that was part of the problem too. He, he was told different stories, but never really knew how they died because the family was never told after the war officially that they were dead. And then stories filtered through about executions. So they were left really hanging in the lurch with nothing to hang on to, you know, nowhere to go to to grieve and they just didn't know what happened and when I was speaking to Bev she didn't know what happened either exactly what the details were so it was important really to tell Dickie's story and the story of his mother and relatives and, bro and uncles to help the family I think find out what really happened sometimes these things it's good to know eventually you know the best evidence I agree I agree and I think it's almost like a blessing honestly that you came along Finally, when you did, you know, in their lifetimes, still to put all of this together in a way that I hope that has helped them kind of move on. Although the story is horrible. I mean, the story is horrible about everything that happened. It was, it was very deliberate. It was not, you know, collateral damage in a bombing or something, which is terrible, but also a, a frequent thing in war. So I know we'll talk about this, of course, as, as the episode goes on, the interview goes on, but yeah, it's the, the truth is, is as hard to face as the unknown in this case, I would imagine. Yeah, well, I think so. But but it's, it's still important to have the truth. I think what happened after the war is that authorities tried to protect this family by not discussing the details with them. And that was a mistake. Hmm. Yeah, I, I can agree. I, I see why they would do it, but I agree that it was a mistake for sure. So let's go all the way back to before the war began, if we can. You said Rabaul is in New Guinea now, but at the time that was an Australian territory. So were they settlers? Like what was the family doing there to begin with? Right, so I guess a little bit about Rabaul and New Guinea. New Guinea used to be owned by the Germans. It was a German colony in the late 19th century. And during the First World War, when war was declared, Australia invaded the German colony of New Guinea. It's only, it's just to the north of Australia, that sort of archipelago of islands between Australia and um, Asia. Uh, and so when Australia invaded, it, after the war, it was given a mandate to govern 
New Guinea as a, a mandated territory. So it, it it was there really to protect the locals and to make sure that, that, you know, eventually it would be handed over to them. It wasn't sovereign Australian territory. It was a, a mandated territory, which they controlled. But of course, Australia at the time treated it like a colony. And what happened was it took away the German plantations and gave the German coconut plantations. There were plantations of coconuts, plantations of rubber, cocoa, coffee, and there were mines up there as well, a very rich, fertile area. So Australia thought, you know, it was, it was very important economically. It had a lot of resources and Australia treated it as a colony and put a lot of its the veterans up there. Veterans were allowed to bid for these coconut plantations. And so one of those veterans was a bloke called um, Ted Harvey. He'd served technically in the First World War, so he was allowed to buy one of these plantations. And he bought a plantation on the north coast of New Guinea, you know, facing north the Bismarck Sea, beautiful area, coconut palms everywhere, obviously, and he managed uh, that plantation. He, in fact, owned it outright. So he owned the plantation. The 1930s was a time of the Depression, so he struggled um, there. A lot of things happened, but he was basically trading as the Depression hit, he found a bit of gold on his plantation, so he managed to survive with that. He employed a lot of the local people and he had to pay their wages, but essentially they could live off the land in that sort of area. So the Depression didn't affect him as much as it affected other people around the world and in Australia. And so on the other side, in, in South Australia, in Adelaide, at the same time when Ted Harvey was managing his plantation in the 1930s near Rebel in New Guinea, Marjorie Manson, the woman he eventually or became his partner, they didn't officially marry, but it was Marjorie and Dickie who went over and were eventually killed. Marjorie was growing up in Adelaide and during the Depression with her brothers, and they were all sort of teenagers, late teens then, and because they couldn't find work, they had to travel for work. Marjorie became pregnant with a little boy to, he, she became pregnant, she became pregnant to a bloke who was a wrestler and he also built train carriages. And he went looking for gold and so she followed him around Australia until eventually they ended up in Brisbane. And through a strange, through strange circumstances, Harvey came over to Brisbane and she went back to Rabaul with Harvey and they lived together on this sort of idyllic life really, on this plantation, you know, in the tropics overlooking a beautiful sea. She struggled, she was poor in Australia and she suddenly found a rich man and he took care of her and her son and she eventually invited her brothers over to help work the plantation. So in some ways they, I think they believe they've, they'd fallen on their feet because you know from poverty in Australia where there was no work to this idyllic tropical paradise. Plenty of food really, lots of fruit, fish, wild pigs, you know, even if they were poor there. And Harvey was still struggling a bit. He did eventually get an inheritance and became quite rich. But in those first few years in the mid to late 1930s before the war, that's when Dickie and Marjorie, his mother, moved over and they lived with Ted Harvey, this fellow who owned the plantation. Hmm, I see. So that does that does sound pretty idyllic. And I've looked at some photos of Rabal since we first got in contact. And you're right, absolutely gorgeous. I have to admit, I would love to visit for sure. And I understand, I, I think that Rabal was a bit of a, a boom town, wasn't it, prior to the war? It seemed like it was, it's kind of a shadow of its former self at this time. That's right. So Rabal's in this beautiful harbor, very deep, one of the best harbors in the world, very, very deep. It was an old canic caldera. So a volcano erupted. An enormous volcano erupted about 1400 years ago, uh, emptied out its reservoir of magma and the whole thing collapsed and the sea rushed in and formed this beautifully round harbour with a small entrance. So sheltered on all sides, very deep, you could put ships right up against the shore. And of course a volcanic area in the tropics where there's lots of rain, the soil is very fertile, and there's plenty of water, just things just grew and so it was an ideal place for coconuts, copra cocoa, rubber. So it had a lot of the things that, you know, industrializing nations at the time, it had iron ore reservoirs, reserves as well. Because of the volcanic activity, there are lots of, it was highly mineralized. So there was gold and all sorts of precious metals. So it really did become a bit of a, a boom town. And in, so after the Australians invaded, took it over, they settled there and, and their trading companies came in and traded up and down the coast with the plantation owners who would sell them copper and rubber. 
and gold, and it, it really did take off. So even during the Depression, Rabaul was doing extremely well. And it's tucked inside this caldera, so it's sheltered, but it's also very hot and steamy. But it was also a beautiful place. With The, the town was really a garden city. It was covered in poinzianas and frangipani and bougainvillea. Everybody had a big garden. They spent a lot of their time in their gardens. And the, the town was just had these wooden houses built mainly by the Germans, but beautiful wooden houses on stilts with big verandas. Magnificent, some of these, especially the official buildings made of wood. It even had a tram system. So it was a, a beautiful place to live, but you know, just a bit hot. Yeah, I can, I can imagine. So I understand also that, I mean, it sounds like Marjorie and, and Dickie, they wound up in a, in a wonderful situation going from a, you know, like a transient prospecting kind of life with Dickie's father to this, this copper plantation there in Rabal. Would you say that was true? That's right. Yes. No, look, and, and so when you do go there, and I, I would highly recommend it, it's a beautiful part of the world. So the inside of the volcanic caldera is very volcanic. And so it's, you know, black soils, black beaches. On the other side of the peninsula, it's white sandy beaches, you know, coconut palms hanging over the beach. And beautiful aspects and, a, and a, an easy, I suppose, place to live where it's not cold ever. You can live quite simply with you know, a very rudimentary shelter, and plenty of food, fish in the sea. So they, they really fell on their feet. And Dickie, of course, being a, you know, eight, nine, ten year old boy who, who was a member of the Scouts back in Australia, just loved it. He could just run around. You could just imagine a little boy in a place like that, down to the beach, running up and down the beaches, I mean, cliffs, coconuts, all sorts of wildlife, all sorts of things to explore. There were, there was a problem with disease, of course, Pretty much everybody there caught uh, malaria, so they had to keep that under control by with quinine, uh, which had its own problems and and also quite isolated. That sort of place also attracted a lot of people who didn't do quite well, I think, in more populated areas. So people who struggle, I think, to fit into normal society tend to drift to the outskirts. And that's you know, Ted Harvey. That sort of describes Ted Harvey's sort of character. He struggles in society and he moved to the outskirts as a sort of a fringe dweller because of I think he had some personality problems so you know you had a lot of people drinking a lot so you know health wise it was a problem for the for the Australians who moved there but for Dickie and Marjorie they thought it was paradise hmm. I can imagine I can imagine so I'm glad that you mentioned that Ted had that odd personality because he had kind of an unusual brush with espionage prior to the war beginning, didn't he, in the 30s? That's right. So Ted, he wasn't in, so he was, so Ted was born in England and came to Australia. He actually got married in England and then ran away from his wife while he was, she was pregnant, came to Australia in the, just before the World War One tried to enlist in the war and it was rejected on medical grounds but it's not clear what grounds they rejected him on i think he lost a finger in a in a sawmill accident so maybe that was it he might have had flat feet but he was rejected he ended up serving as a, a medic on a troop ship so technically he was a veteran but he went to new guinea with i think a few problems already a few personality problems hard to say what they were but he certainly seemed a bit paranoid and he, in the 1930s, he, I think he always thought he'd missed out on the big show, well, you know, the Great War. I think he felt a bit disappointed he hadn't been able to take part. So as war was brewing with Japan and, and Germany, so as, as Europe started to militarize, so did Japan in the 1930s and the Japanese military built up. Japan was industrializing really quickly, needed lots of resources. So Australia had always been worried about Asian from the north and, and this seemed to be something that was going to happen. And all the intelligence at the time told them that Japan was, was seeking to expand its territory to get more resources, which it did through its companies. They all moved down into the Pacific and started trading at places like Rabaul and competing with the Australian trading companies. And so Ted Harvey at the time knew war was coming and there was a, a program set up by the Australian Navy, Naval Intelligence system of coast watches along the archipelago of islands north of Australia. And the idea was to watch out for military movements, ships and planes. It was instituted, it was sort of activated, I guess, 
in the late 1930s as war seemed more likely. The Navy sent some people around to all the islands to try to recruit the plantation owners and they would give them uh, tele radios, like big two-way radios, and with which they would contact through a secret channel. Port Moresby as the sort of base of naval intelligence then and you know inform them of the movements of Japanese planes and ships. So that was being set up. Ted Harvey received a visit from one of these naval intelligence men and was accepted into the coast watching group. He ended up buying his own tele radio. So the idea was he'd sit there and watch, uh, watch for troop movements should especially should an invasion occur, which eventually it did, and the Coast Watch Service did a pretty spectacular job in World War II of telling the Allies and the Americans and the Australians where the Japanese planes were and the ships were, and it became a real headache for the Japanese. So, so Ted was keen to be part of that, but I think at some stage they realised that he wasn't quite stable enough, and they took away his Coast Watch status. But he persisted anyway and, and used his radio to wait with Port Moresby, um, even though they didn't want him to. <laughs> well, that was, I've read quite a bit about the Coast Watchers. I'd actually like to do an episode entirely dedicated to them one day because it is a fascinating story, like you said. And what's most interesting to me is just the recruitment of the locals, the plantation owners, rather than, you know, deploying people who are with the Signal Corps or something like that at the time, but you know, you've got these people spread across thousands of square miles of island chains and all that all over the South Pacific. And so just put them to use because they know the land, they know the people and everything. Well, that's it. Exactly. So the plantation owners, especially they had the resource. They also had the contacts with the local population who they employed as labor. They could live off the land and, and a lot of them had suffered terribly during the depression. When I say suffered, they had no income, but they still managed to live. As I said, you know, there were ducks, there were pigs. The fish, so they lived pretty well on nothing. So you know, during war, that's the ideals. But they were hardened to the local environment, and they all had little uh, jungle escapes. So Ted Harvey discovered gold on his property, and he had a camp up a up a gully where his gold mine was, and that served him as a sort of a hideaway during the war. So a lot of the plantation owners had that as well. So they were pretty much ideally placed to do it. And as I said, a lot of them were, how should I say, they were very they were very hardy men to start with. They moved there because they, they liked that sort of environment. And and so they were perfectly really adapted and they were very keen to help. A lot of them did some amazing work. Very brave, very brave men and women who sometimes stayed back with them. Yeah, and they really managed to turn the tide of the war, or at least avoid a lot of unnecessary deaths amongst the Americans. Hmm. Yeah, I can imagine. I can imagine. So were they, did these Coast Watchers, did they receive a stipend or were they drafted or were they just doing their patriotic duty as volunteers? They were volunteers. Eric Felt, who was the man who was in charge of them, I think 38 or 9, I took a boat around all the islands, so the New Guinea Islands and the Solomons, and he called in at each of the plantations and pretty much everybody volunteered to be part of the Coast Watch Service and stay back and, and watch and monitor if should there be an invasion. So I don't know whether they actually received any money. They probably did receive a stipend. I think a lot of them were given voluntary status in the Royal Australian Volunteer Forces. So they were combatants, but they were also spies mm -hmm. and, uh, and they were treated as spies as well. So if they were found, they were shot. Right. Yeah. A number of them did pass away, including Ted, of course, but others as well from what I recall, and some were in uniform and some were not in uniform if from just from the photos and everything that I've seen in the past. That's right, yes. Yeah, uh, in, in wartime, if you're a spy, you, you would expect, I think, not to survive if you were caught. And so and they so they moved around in the jungles quite a bit. They had to keep moving because the Japanese were hunting them quite thoroughly. It must have been a very tense time. You can just imagine how terrifying it, it would have been. But a lot of these men also thrived in that environment. And yeah, they, they did... There were, some of them survived the whole war and came out the other side, you know, quite well. Uh, so they, they, I think it took a certain type of personality to to cope with, with that sort of stress. But as you say, a lot of them were found and shot. The Japanese were very, very concerned about the, the, the coast watchers. And because they were losing so many planes and ships, 
Right. Yeah, they were. They had a very serious interest in in putting a stop to the coast fosters for how effective they were. Uh, let me ask you, Ian. Do I recall correctly from your book that Ted he also traveled to Japan before the war began at some point? That's right. So Ted was so as I said, the Japanese economy was expanding, industrializing, and the Japanese with a million babies a year, so it had an exploding population on an island with with sort of limited resources. So, so the Japanese had to expand their territory to get you know rubber and oil and copper and all the things that were needed to keep to keep industrializing. This is before the war. So the South Seas Company, I mean, his trading company came down to the islands and was trading or trying to trade with the local plantation owners and compete with the Australians. And so Ted, often these trading companies would get the plantation owners to sign an agreement that they would only trade with this one company, but Ted refused to do that. He wanted to trade with everybody and he began trading with the Japanese especially after he had his inheritance. He was suddenly rich. He was buying things in town and the Japanese thought, well, he might, he might have struck gold or had some knowledge of some source. He certainly knew where there were iron ore deposits. And so Ted Harvey suddenly became rich and attracted the attention of the Japanese and they wanted to know a bit more about it. So he traded with them, became friendly with a few of the Japanese traders and they offered to, or well, they gave him a ticket basically to Japan to go on a bit of a tour. They were trying to groom him at the time because Japan was allied with Germany at the time, of course, before the war, before Japan entered the war. It had a partnership with the Germans. There were German spies in Japan and most of the Japanese traders were also spies. The, the, sort of the Japanese industrial complex, if you like, the politics, the military complex and the, and the industrial complex was really one it operated as a, as a, with the same goal. And so basically all the Japanese traders were part of the military machine. And the idea, of course, was to expand the Japanese trading territory down into the Pacific and the South Seas to get the resources they needed. And so Ted came back. They wanted him to write some propaganda for some Japanese papers. And they were, they were grooming him as a potential spy for them. So what happened was he went to the Australian army and said, you know, Japanese have approached me, but you know, I'll tell you what I see when I'm in Japan. And, and he, he wanted to become a double agent. But by that time, of course, there was already a lot of suspicion about, about Ted Harvey and his, his personality and whether he was stable enough for such a job. And they were also alarmed that the Japanese had, had approached him, so they didn't really want anything to do with him. But nevertheless, he went to Japan, came back, and then, and then took Marjorie and Dickie with him back to Japan as well. And then after after his trip to Japan, went straight down to Sydney and made an appointment with the Australian Army and gained an interview where he told them what he saw. I don't think they were very impressed, but he was certainly trying hard to be a spy. And yeah, I think that was held against him, obviously, later. Mm, yeah, I can, I can see why that would be. There's plenty of people, I'm sure, that volunteer for that kind of work that are not cut out for that kind of work. And probably it was for the best if the Australian military or naval intelligence took a look at him and said, despite his willingness, we're not, we're not going to go through with this. That was probably for the best, I would imagine. Yeah, I'm, I'm not quite sure what information he passed on to them, but he went to, I think it was Osaka, anyway, one of the big ports and fly a lot of the ships. So he would have come back with some information that might have been handy. It was easy enough for people from Rabaul to go to Japan, by the way, because the main shipping route from Australia was up to Japan. A lot of Australians used to take holidays and the steamers would go from Melbourne, Sydney, across to Rabaul and then up through Indonesia and to Japan. And that was a popular route. And so a lot of people from Rabaul would take holidays in Japan because you just jumped on a steamer. There were a couple of steamers a week and you just got on board they were quite well you know, accommodated. It was quite luxurious and you could take a holiday for a few weeks up in Japan and come back without too much effort. So hmm. it was an easy enough thing to do. The Japanese were becoming quite uh, quite active in the Rabaul area in the couple of years before the war. So let's fast forward just a little bit. The war is looming and then the invasion finally happens. I guess it was right around New Year of 1942, wasn't it? That a few weeks after the attack on Pearl Harbor and Guam, that they moved towards New Guinea and Australia. So as I understand it, the family decided to stay in Rabaul, even though most of the people from that area were evacuating back to 
Australia proper. Is that right? That's that's right. So in 1941, war was looming. Australia sent a garrison to defend Rabaul. They weren't supposed to under the mandate. They were, it was illegal to, to fortify mandated islands. But the Japanese were doing it just to the north of the equator on their mandated islands of truck. Australia sent a garrison to Rabaul, Air Force, Army, Navy, and that was in 1941. Japanese... They, Rabaul is very strategic. It was a place where you could ambush the Americans as they were coming across. They wanted to keep America out of the war. They wanted to be able to move freely in the Pacific without the... They knew once... So they were planning a war anyway. They were planning to invade Rabaul before even attacking Pearl Harbor. They knew that once they attacked Pearl Harbor, they'd have to come straight down to Rabaul to stop the Americans coming and re... It was basically a siege of Australia is what they wanted to do. They wanted to put an arc of defences across that archipelago of islands north of Australia to stop Americans, the American forces coming down and retaliating. So they were planning to evade Rabaul in November. So December 7 was Pearl Harbour. And then about six weeks later, they invaded Rabaul. But they, pretty much straight after the declaration of war, straight after Pearl Harbour, um, they started sending reconnaissance planes from truck down to Rabaul and they started bombing Rabaul just after New Year. But the, the, the forces from Pearl Harbor, the planes and the ships that attacked Pearl Harbor, came straight down to Rabaul. They met up with convoys of troops and machinery that were going to establish Rabaul as a fortress for Japan, and they came steaming straight down, and their intention was to to take Rabaul with overwhelming force. There were several aircraft carriers. The Australians there just couldn't compete. There were only a thousand men dozen Wirraway fighters, which were really just training planes. They, they had no chance against the Japanese Zeros, for instance. So, yeah, the, the once war was declared, there were plans made to evacuate civilian women and children from Rabaul. But strangely, they didn't plan to evacuate the men. I think Australia had the idea that it shouldn't, it shouldn't run away. They insisted the men stay behind, the civilian men, but they took away, they evacuated the women and children. Now, on Lassell Plantation, Marjorie and Dickie were told to evacuate, but they, but Marjorie, well, it was said that Ted Harvey wouldn't let her evacuate, but I don't think she wanted to either, because she had two brothers there. And coming back to Australia, she would have lost everything, and she, you know, she couldn't sort of, she couldn't bear, basically, to leave her brothers. She stayed behind with Dickie, which was a strange decision, but it was the decision they made. I think they thought, having been to Japan, that the Japanese wouldn't, were kind, you know, polite people and wouldn't bother them. When Australia invaded New Guinea in the First World War, it let the German plantation owners keep working their plantations. And the thoughts amongst the plantation owners in New Guinea was that the Japanese would do the same. Oh, wow. That was a ter terrible miscalculation on their part, I guess. That's unfortunate. Yeah, because, I mean, the Japanese are renowned for the way that they treated people and the way that they treated this family as well. Yeah, well, this was right at the start of the war, and they weren't aware of that. Right, so, of course. Uh, well, they would have been aware of it in, in China, of course, because the Japanese are fighting the Chinese for, for many years, and the Chinese population of Rabaul was terrified. But, you know, there was a lot of racial misconceptions at the time. I think the Europeans in, in New Guinea really thought the Japanese would, would not hurt them. But you know, obviously the Chinese and other ethnic minorities there would, would face some problems. There was also there was also a little bit of scepticism about whether the Japanese really intended to come down. You know, at the start of war, it's never quite clear what's going to happen next. And so, you know, I think Ed Harvey was probably a bit optimistic, and so was so was Marjorie. But obviously, a bad mistake. Hmm. I can see that. Yeah, I I did not realize that Rabaul was such a strategic location. But you mentioned it's. Uh, target of, of multiple aircraft carriers and troop carriers and all that. And that's, that's really serious. I didn't realize that they had come not long after Pearl Harbor. That was like their next target in line. Straight down. As soon as they, as soon as they attacked Pearl Harbor, they came straight down. They, and so they met up and they had a South Seas force, which was a combination of a lot of the, the Japanese fighters and aircraft carriers that attacked Pearl Harbor. Plus, as I said, the convoys to take Rabaul. Rabaul was, 
important for a lot of reasons, like it was a perfect harbour, easily defended, or well, not easily defended, but you could defend it quite well, had high hills around it for you know, anti-aircraft. And it wasn't, so during World War II, Rabaul was became the US's longest battle because it was basically an air battle that lasted the entire war. Oh, wow. Rabaul was never taken by the Americans. It was just bypassed. But it was used. It was, it was bombed daily by American, New Zealand, Australian forces. And, you know, so Rabaul at the time of the invasion had only, well, had about 1,400 Europeans in the town. It was a little Australian town. When the Japanese came down, it grew to a city of a hundred thousand Japanese. Oh my gosh! So it became it was it was the base for what was going to be the invasion of Port Moresby, the taking of Port Moresby, which would give the Japanese bombers, long range bombers, you know, the ability to attack airfields in northern Australia. And it was the launching pad for the Solomon Islands campaigns and the terrible battles on the beaches that you'd recall at Guadalcanal. So it was heavily fortified and it was the, and, and they were also, it was the Battle of the Coral Sea as well. The ships were gathered there before the Battle of the Coral Sea in which the Americans and Japan fought each other to a stalemate. So it was a big, important place strategically for a lot of reasons. It became really the center of the Pacific War, especially the war in the South Pacific. Hmm. Wow. Well, okay. I can see that now for sure. So how quickly... Was that 1,000-man garrison that you mentioned, were they overwhelmed? Were they able to hold out very long? No, they didn't. They, were, they weren't well supplied. I think they tried, but the Australians didn't have the, the planes or the, the guns. They, so the Australian garrison had, as I said, a dozen Wirraway fighters, but they were shot down basically in the first wave of zero fighters coming into the town. They had anti-aircraft and shorter ship you know, defences, but a lot of the troops weren't well supplied. There weren't very many, for instance, um, Thompson submachine guns among them. They sort of had to ration them out. Mm. When George came into the harbour to offload a load of copra um, just before the invasion, he came in and, in the plantation lugger. Uh, he ended up joining the militia and, and was given a 303 rifle with 100 rounds of ammunition and told to stand on a beach and you know repel the japanese invaders so they weren't they weren't really equipped and they they were told to fight to the death they faced such overwhelming odds there was no way they could stand mm, yeah, clearly so what happened after the japanese took over like how were the locals treated was it just like the chinese residents had feared the chinese were treated very badly so the japanese came down as i said george had come from the plantation there was a ship in, in port that was going to take a last load of copra back to Australia. But by then, the, Amer the women and children had been evacuated. Um, so it was only the men who were left. George was told by Ted Harvey to come in with a with the plantation lugger. This is Dickie's brother, sorry, Dickie's uncle, Marjorie's brother. He sailed the plantation lugger in and parked beside the ship that was taking on the copra. The, the locals wanted the ship not to take the copra, but to take, to take the remaining civilians back to Australia and the Australian government refused to do that. So the civilians weren't allowed to escape. The copra was loaded, but then just as the copra, the ship was about to depart, there was an air raid and swarms of Japanese zeros came into the harbour, bombed the ship and the, and the George's, the plantation lugger next to it was sunk. So George was left behind and he joined the local militia basically the day before the invasion itself. They were told to guard, to guard a, a section of beach. This was the first beach landing of the South Pacific War. Hmm. And it was the Japanese who were landing and the Australians who were trying to repel them. So, you know, in dawn on that day, I think it was about the 23rd of January, the Japanese came ashore and George and the militia were there right where waves of Japanese barges were coming in to offload troops. They just started firing and using mortars. They destroyed all the barges that came ashore and they and they, they all thought you know, they'd lost nobody. So they all thought they'd won, that they'd repel the Japanese. But then as dawn broke, you know, the, the harbour was just full of Japanese ships and planes and barges and the Japanese zeros started coming in. So they had to flee into the jungle. So they all basically retreated. But the Japanese took over pretty much immediately. They went straight into the town on that morning, rounded up 
all the enemy, I suppose, non-combatants and combatants, put them into prisons, into guarded areas. The locals were treated reasonably well, but the enemy wasn't treated very well at all, I don't think. Initially, there was some nod to the rules of war, and they were, you know, people were fed, but eventually, eventually, especially when Japan started to be started to take some hits from the Americans. So the Battle of the Coral Sea, there was a lot of animosity by the Japanese towards the the Australians, and then there was quite a bit of brutality after that. But you know, there was as I say, there were thousands of Japanese pouring in. There, was, there were only a few hundred really Australians left at the time, apart from the you know a thousand men from the battalion who'd gone into the jungle, and so especially the soldiers, when they were captured, if they didn't surrender immediately, or if they put up a fight and then surrendered, then they were executed. If you surrendered immediately, you were put into a prison that was arranged at Rabaul, and eventually those prisoners were shipped off to Hainan Island off China. The idea was to, to take them for the duration of the war and perhaps use them as slave labour. A lot of the prisoners included, it was about, it was well over a thousand Australian military and civilians. Unfortunately, on the way back to Hainan Island, that the Montevideo Maru, the prison ship, was torpedoed by an American submarine and they all drowned. So that was Australia's largest maritime disaster, wartime maritime disaster. So that was unfortunate, but the Australians weren't treated very well, especially those who tried to fight back after the Japanese invasion. And even the, some of the locals tried to mount a resistance. I know the Tolai, the local people there, there was a, an attempted resistance movement, but they were many people were beheaded. So I think the Tolai especially suffered probably greater casualties than the Australians did hmm. in, eventually. Did the did resistance continue through the whole duration of the occupation, or did they suppress it pretty quickly after they landed? It continued in, in bits and pieces. So there were certainly some Tolai who wouldn't let it rest. And the Australian Coast Watchers who survived just kept fighting and reporting. So it was a constant problem for the Japanese. I suppose the spies amongst them. So they had the secret police, the Kempai Tai, the sort of Japanese equivalent of the Gestapo who would befriend the locals and try to establish spy networks around the coast to try to track down the coast watchers, such as Ted Harvey. By that time, Ted Harvey, Marjorie and Dickie had fled inland and were in their, in their gold mining or hideaway up in the mountains. And so they were searching, they were searching for Ted Harvey, as well as other Coast Watchers, who they knew were in the area. And so the Coast Watchers would basically, if they had a working radio, would watch for planes, Japanese planes flying overhead, and they could relay that information to Port Moresby, depending on which direction, how many there were, as well as ships at sea. And then those forces could be intercepted by American fighters. So that's what happened, and that was very successful. So the Japanese were very concerned about this, and they really wanted to, to make a lesson as well of any coast watchers that they found to deter the others. Yeah, certainly, certainly. Do you know, were they using anything like radio direction finding equipment, or was it more like constantly searching and interrogating people trying to find the coast watchers? Yeah, it was constantly searching and, and trying to get locals, especially the lo so the plantation owners employed a lot of like hundreds of local people. And so they went to the local villages and tried to get the local people who would have known where the jungle hideouts of the plantation owners were, try to get them to talk. That's what eventually happened with Ed Harvey, one of the locals who knew where the gold mining hideaway was, told the, the Japanese and they sent off a search party to find them. But it was a constant battle, I guess, of running and hiding for the Coast Watchers and also searching. By the, by the Japanese police and uh, Kempai Tai. So it was a constant struggle, I think, for both sides there. It's an, an, amazing, really, that, that uh, some of the Coast Watchers and some of the, the local people held out for so long. Oh, I know it. And if, especially if you consider the fact that eventually, I mean, the war lasted nearly four more years after that initial invasion, over three and a half more years anyway. So that's it's hard to Real, it's it's hard to understand how those guys could keep up with that level of of stress and movement and danger and change plans and, and everything, especially with the high casualty rate that they were suffering. 
And, so just uh, incredible really guys. Amazing for sure. men, amazing men. I'm not sure how well they would operate in normal society, but geez, <laughs> they worked really well the way that there was a guy called John Stokey who was a neighbor, a neighboring plantation owner of Ted Harvey. So John Stokey was notorious amongst the Japanese and he kept changing his name as well. They thought he was another Coast Watcher called Paul Mason, who was who was quite a famous coast watcher on Bougainville. And, and they were actually related. I think they were brothers-in-law. But John Stokey, John Stokey was nearly caught so many times and just escaped by the skin of his teeth, like dozens of times. Just amazing. Some people have incredible luck. But he, I think he thoroughly enjoyed the experience. <laughs> Some people really thrived in that environment. And he survived the war. Yeah. Wow, that's impressive. And, you know, for a certain type of person, that's how you really feel alive is at the the edge of, of danger there for certain. So maybe he was one of those guys. He was born to it, I wow. think, yeah. Oh, and before we go on, I want to take a moment to fill you guys in on the newest tool I'm wearing and carrying in daily life. It's the Donovan Non-Metallic Knife from Black Triangle. If you aren't familiar with Black Triangle, then you're really missing out. I love these guys because they put the dagger in cloak and dagger. If you've been following me for a while now, then you probably already know why Black Triangle has called their newest non-metallic knife the Donovan. It's named after General William Wild Bill Donovan, the head of the U.S. Office of Strategic Services during World War II. Under Donovan, the OSS was unconventional, unexpected, and highly effective, just like Black Triangle's tools. The Donovan is manufactured here in the United States. It's made entirely of G10 composite, and it comes with a thermoplastic sheath and a couple of amazing extras, which you'll have to see for yourself. You can find it at blacktriangle.com. That's B-L-K triangle.com. You can also get 15% off your first order with Black Triangle using the discount code SPYCRAFT101 or by navigating to blacktriangle.com slash SPYCRAFT101. I love mine, and I know you're going to love yours too. So, Ian, you mentioned it just a minute ago that eventually the family was identified and betrayed by someone that they knew there on the island. So can you talk about how their luck kind of ran out in the end? Yeah, so be before the war, Ted Harvey, like many plantation owners, was pretty tough on, on his local workers. And you know, plantation owners would often, well, not all of them, but some would beat their workers. They And the workers, obviously, they resented, I think, these Europeans being on their land and making money and, you know, controlling them. So when the Japanese invaded, a couple of the disaffected workers were trying to help the Japanese track down the Harveys. And eventually the Kempaitai were led by one of the disaffected workers called Joe Rocker to Harvey's hideout. You can imagine the Japanese troops sort of coming ashore at Lassell Plantation, seeing the empty house that had been bombed a few times. There'd been a couple of Japanese raids there. And in fact, Harvey's radio had been damaged in one of those raids and he couldn't transmit, he could only receive. So, and these radios are big, they were about, weighed about 60 kilos. They were you know, battery operated. You had to charge the batteries with petrol engines. And you know, so he was spent most of the those couple of months in the jungle trying to fix it with Jim, Marjorie's brother, Dickie's uncle. So they're all at this gold mining camp in the jungle. Japanese came ashore, were led up the up the valley to the campsite and came into the campsite and surprised Harvey and Marjorie. So Harvey stumbled out of the tent half asleep. I think one of the Japanese, uh, I think Marjorie picked up a bag and a pistol fell out of it. One of the Japanese came up to Marjorie and slapped her across the face. And then Dickie ran up and Dickie by then was only 10 years old and punched the Japanese soldier in the head and the Japanese soldier kicked him to the ground. Um, so Dickie was the only person basically who put up a fight, but the combination of the radio and the pistol really just doomed the family, the radio especially, of course. The Japanese were looking for Coast Watchers, and Harvey was you know, technically that. Whether he was officially a Coast Watcher or not didn't matter, he had the radio. So they were taken back to Rabaul along with Jimmy and one of the plantation, one of the European plantation managers. They were taken back and, and put in a, a prison camp in Rabaul where they were kept until a trial was organized by the Japanese Navy. And it was, it was a court martial of this family. And it was actually arranged by commander of the, the Japanese fleet, Admiral Inui. And he was the one who signed off on it and, and convened the court martial. The court martials lasted for about three days. Very few details left of it. The Japanese would have had would have kept records, but 
before the end of the war, uh, as I said, the Jap Americans, Australians, didn't actually invade Rabaul and try to take it back. They skipped it because they thought the losses against 100,000 Japanese would be so horrendous. They didn't. They, all they needed to do was isolate Rabaul, which they did. But before the Japanese surrendered, they burnt all the documents. So it's difficult to find out. But there were, there'd been a couple of witnesses who, who survived, people who were at the trial, at the court-martial, some Japanese officers, and they gave enough details to to understand what happened during that trial. Hmm. That's so incredible to me that they put the whole family on trial like that. I understand that Marjorie had a weapon and Ted had a radio. It sounds like this was his personal radio that he had purchased after his Coast Watcher radio was taken away. Is that right? That's right. So he purchased the radio and, the, and the, because he'd already had a radio, the Coast Watchers actually gave him a special crystal, diode crystal, with which he would transmit on a special wavelength to Paul mm. Well, They took that crystal away, but Harvey still had the radio. And he was trying to, at that stage, while in the jungle, he was trying to contact the Australians to come and rescue Dickie and Marjorie and take them away. He sort of had a change of mind. Anyway, so the, the trial was convened. This was right at the early stages of the war. So the Japanese had only been in the war, the Pacific War, for you know the first couple of months. And so they convened a court-martial. In future, they wouldn't have done that, but right at the start of the war, they, they tried to follow the rules of war. They convened the court-martial for these you know, spies and put them on trial for three days. Well, Dickie didn't attend the trial, but he was. they were all sort of tried as one. Marjorie, Ted, Jimmy, Marjorie's brother, and the plantation manager were all taken to a local office building and tried by a Japanese court martial, which included the senior officers of the now Japanese garrison, as well as the officers of the fleet, the fourth fleet, Japanese fleet that was in the harbour. I knew he didn't attend himself, but he sent a representative. So it was really high level. The full weight, basically, of the Japanese Navy was brought to bear on this family. And because you know, Harvey had, he admitted, tried to signal enemy aircraft. He'd, he'd actually laid out stones on the beach, apparently, with an arrow to show where the Japanese were coming from or flying to, so the reconnaissance aircraft of the Americans or Australians could, could see. And, you know, Marjorie had a hidden revolver in a purse, so it was pretty telling. They weren't given a representative, so they couldn't, like, I don't even think they were, were allowed to speak. They were given an interpreter, so they weren't represented at the trial. But you know, this was a court martial, and during a war, and the and the outcome was really preordained. So, what happened was, so it went for three days. It was quite a substantial one. The evidence was gathered, and the court then made its decision. The family was told, you know, they'd be severely punished, but there was no mention of the word death, and they thought, oh, well, severely punished that might mean that we're interred for the rest of the war or they, you know, they're going to imprison us back in Japan. So Harvey and Marjorie thanked the judges, not knowing that they'd actually been sentenced to death. And they didn't, it seems they didn't know. Well, they might have guessed at the end, obviously, but they didn't know right up until the end that they were going to be shot. Hmm. So I'm surprised that a court-martial would last for three days with no defense presented at all. Was this a lot of ceremonial stuff? I mean, it is a pretty preordained guilty verdict. I mean, the, you know, Ted obviously was committing the activity that he was arrested for and Marjorie was armed and Dickie didn't do anything, but he was collateral, I guess, under yeah, their... Yeah, three days, their... that's right. So it, th I guess there was, there would have been a lot of witnesses. So there, it was a show trial, obviously, but it also I suspect it was meant to represent the Coast Watchers as a group um, that they would try Ted in this way to provide an example. So they were pretty thorough by the sound of it, although none of the records of the trial exist. So it's hard to say exactly what went on. But it was quite thorough and there were a lot of witnesses and a lot of documents tendered. So after the war, actually the Australian war crimes people had a look at what happened to the family. I discovered this in the archives. And it was, you know, it's obviously, it was obviously horrific, but Australian major Alex McKay looked at it closely and said that, you know, a prima facie case couldn't be raised against the Japanese to convict anybody of a war crime. And, and, and he said that the formalities of the trial appeared to be fair and in accordance with the Hague rules and international justice. So there was nothing they could do, even though one of the people sent us to death was an 11 year old boy for espionage. He did say that at that age, there should have been a presumption 
of an inability to commit a crime, not having the details of the trial, they couldn't say that, that it was a war crime to have shot him. Hmm. Yeah, it sounds like they obeyed, I don't know if I'd say obey the letter of the law, but they observed some formalities. Truly, I can't get over the idea of lumping Dickie in with Ted and Marjorie, for sure. Marjorie is, you know, maybe yes, maybe no, she was involved. You know, Ted, I get it. He's, he's doing what they said he did, but it's, it's still barbaric no matter what kind of ceremonial pedigree you put on it, you know, to execute an 11-year-old for espionage. Even if he did punch one of your soldiers, I can't really find any excuse for that for, for any reason. But that punching one of the soldiers was a capital crime. And the Japanese would have considered that. I, th I think there's also an argument that Dickey, even though he was 10, he could be committed of espionage and, and you know sentenced to death if he had malicious intent, if he knew that he was committing the crime and he knew it was a crime, that, that is to spy on the Japanese, if he knew it was wrong, then the Japanese were within their right. But as I said, there's no evidence either way, really, to, to say that because it was all destroyed at the end of the war. So they couldn't bring anybody right. to justice over that. Yeah, kids certainly have been used to conduct espionage in the past or conduct some sort of intelligence gathering, for sure. There's no question about that. But, you know, you just, you don't shoot them, you know, when you find them. You know, that's, that's an no, excusable. No, I, th I think, exactly. So the Japanese, they, they may have thought they had no choice but to execute Marjorie. I don't, I don't, this is no excuse, and I, and, but you know, maybe they thought they were doing a kindness by killing him. Yeah, they were going to make him an orphan on, an, on a contested yeah, island. Killing, I mean, his life was about exactly. to get bad no matter what. Yeah, that's right. So perhaps that was what happened, but it's, it's hard to know. It was brutal and, and really unforgivable, of course. So how, how were the death sentences carried out? Right, so they were, they were put into the back of a truck. I think really, even at the last moments, and the, their trip out to the execution site was described as well by witnesses. They were kept separately in the prisoner of war camp at Rabaul, and so there were, the Australians were kept in a, in a camp next to them, but they were kept separately in a special hut. They were loaded onto a truck one evening, and then on the way they picked up a couple of other guards. They had a, a firing squad basically with them. They were driven out to what used to be the bowel rubbish dump. They called it the Malay Hole. And that rubbish dump was underneath the volcano, one of the volcanoes that was still active in the Rabaul caldera. It was only a few miles away from the actual town. It's a small volcano, but, but quite dangerous. And it had erupted a few years earlier. In fact, it had erupted during the invasion, just briefly as well, spectacularly. But it was quiet at the moment. So they were taken out there. This site near the rubbish dump at Rabaul became one of the major execution sites for the Japanese and a lot of American airmen were executed on this site. Um, mm. So Dickey and his family were the, amongst the first to be executed there. In fact, they were probably the first. They were taken to that site, blindfolded in the truck, led out of the truck and they all held hands. By that stage, they must have known what was happening. Mm -hmm. And then the Japanese who witnessed it described the dicky standing between Ted Harvey and Marjorie, all of them holding hands, and the firing squad of, I think it was about three, I shot them and they fell backwards into a pit and were buried underneath this volcano. So I've been to the site and it's changed a bit because there have been eruptions since, but it's quite an eerie place. It's The site of the volcano is very quiet. It's a bit like standing in snow. You know, that, that absorbs all the sound. So when you're standing there, there's nothing. You can hear nothing except, you know, maybe the ringing in your ears. There's, and it's, it's quite an eerie place. And, you know, you're looking around and there's the desolation of the volcanic lava fields around you. But then in the distance, you know, the, the tall mountains of the Bainings and the thunderstorm peaks, it's quite sort of beautiful but horrific at the same time. But so there, they are buried still there they were never recovered as well as there would have been American servicemen there although some American servicemen were recovered from that site as well in that, that execution site hmm. well it's it is terrible what happened to them but like you said and from the photos I've seen it's it is kind of a beautiful final resting place to be honest and there are much worse places to end up at the end I think that's I guess that's the best front I can put on it honestly a terrible story yeah like no it's hard that's true you, you try to find something positive to say but really it was it was horrific and, right. and a terrible tragedy and, and it really and it's it affected this family the survivors 
generations. These war atrocities, you know, the, the trauma, it lasts generations. It, trauma is passed on. So the surviving family members really never recovered. And it's, the, the trauma is still there today. Speaking to Bev, mm-hmm. Dickie's cousin, you know, it's still really upsetting. And it plays on people's minds, uh, people's lives. It's a very sad, sad thing uh, to think that uh, Dickie, if he was still alive today, would probably be about 90. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's living memory even... You can imagine that life that hasn't been lived. That's, you know, that's just one person's tragedy. But, but it's, it's a tragedy that sort of expands you know, throughout generations. Exactly. And his, you know, the way that I feel his surviving family members and millions of others, billions of others really in history, they're also casualties of the war, even if they weren't injured because of the damage that it did to them for the rest of their lives. Just like you talked about, I think George at the beginning, he was essentially wounded for the next 70 years because of what happened to his family, even though he wasn't there that day. And that's a story that's played out to a, one degree or another with everyone all over the world. Exactly, yes. And with this, the memories are destroyed as well. So much is lost. And you can imagine, and so on a, on a, that's right, on, on a vast scale, we're looking at, at what's happening in Ukraine at the moment. Mm-hmm. The, the trauma of what's happening will just last for ages. The damage that's done is more than the people killed. The casualties of war are everybody who knows them. Oh, yes. And these days we can see so much more of what's happening in real time, of course, but we're still only getting a narrow slice of it. And there's going to be a lot of unknown tragedies and forgotten tragedies that are happening like right right this minute, right this minute they're happening in Ukraine and other parts of the world, of course. And so it's it's so wonderful that you were able to go back and at least find one of these stories and piece it all together for people to learn from decades after it occurred. Yeah, I think that it's important to remember it's interesting that we do forget this is a major event in Australian history and Australians have forgotten it. I think Rabaul is better remembered in America because it was a, a well-known American battle. Mm-hmm. But in Australia, it's not. And it's it's not because it was kept secret at the time. The, the women and children who were evacuated weren't allowed to talk about it. The people, not many people survived. Of the 1,400 people, military and civilians, Australians in the town at the time, hardly any of them survived. Most of them were killed. Those who survived were traumatised and didn't talk. So the whole thing was forgotten. It, and it was Australian territory, really, that was invaded. And the headline after the invasion was Australian territory invaded. But that was sort of quickly forgotten with other events in the war. And, you know, Australia's involvement in New Guinea has been forgotten too. So this story, the story of Rabaul doesn't resonate in Australia. You can ask people in Australia. They won't know what you're talking about. But it was a significant event in history. Mm-hmm. It's interesting what we forget as part of our nation's history. And this is one of those big events that we've forgotten. And, and it's a shame we did, but it's interesting that we have for all sorts of reasons. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I, I take it then that there's not anything like a memorial marker at their gravesite or at their former plantation or anything like that? No, there's nothing. There's nothing to mark their deaths. I think since the book was published, there may have been a memorial put in Rabaul, but there are memorials in Rabaul to the, the ship that sank, the, all the people who died on the Montevideo Maru on the way back to Hainan. Mm-hmm. There's nowhere really, when Graham was still alive, there was nowhere for him to go to grieve his family. He really didn't know what happened to them. Even when I was speaking, he thought they were beheaded or, you know, he, and there were rumours that they were on that prison ship. So the family really, really never knew and hardly ever talked about it. So there's nothing really left of them at all, which is a shame. Well, Ian, at least there's your book. You've kind of immortalized them now through your writing. So that's that's a, that's a wonderful thing, even if it came so many years later. Yeah, I hope so. I hope so. It is, it is important to remember. Even if even if we can put it aside occasionally, we, we do need to remember some of the terrible bits in our own lives as well as in the nation, a nation's history. We need to acknowledge them. Absolutely. That's, that's a part of why I do this, and that's a part of why you do what you do as well, I believe. Absolutely, yeah. So, Ian, this has been fascinating. Are you working on anything else right now? Do you have any more nonfiction books coming anytime soon? In fact, I'm just, I'm just right at the end of writing a book, and it's actually a spy book. It's about, oh. I'm not sure whether people in America know the story of the Petrov affair in Australia. It was big news in the mid-1950s. The Russian KGB agents defected in Australia, and a couple, husband and wife. So I'm writing that story, but it's from the perspective of a female Australian security service officer called Moya Horowitz, who was involved with the Petrov affair, but she was a spy during the war and, and a field officer in ASIO, the Australian Security Intelligence Organisation in Australia. 
which is the equivalent of MI5, I guess. She worked with them during that Cold War period, so I'm writing her story. She, she was involved in many of the major Cold War operations in Australia during that time, culminating basically in the Petrov defection. So she helped Okia Petrov, sort of KGB, I suppose, Russian CIA equivalent officer defect. And she has a very interesting story to tell about her experience as a female, I think, in the in the in the spy services that, that's wonderful I'm, I'm very familiar with that story as a matter of fact the petrov affair and i'm really looking forward to reading your book and we'll have to talk about that one on a future episode i've actually i've got a video on my youtube channel right now clips from the petrov affair that just unbelievable that event at the airport with the riot at the airport as the kgb yes, trying to take yes. her away just mind-blowing stuff there for sure so yeah well moya was there so yeah she, she she tells that story yeah good I'm, I'm very much looking forward to that do you have a publishing date already it's the end of this year or early next year, I'd say probably early next year at the rate we're going. Okay. So it should be out another 12 months. Great. Well, you've got a reader here for sure. And hopefully some of my, our listeners will pick that up as well. But yeah, Petrov Affair is fascinating stuff. So I'm looking forward to seeing that expanded as well. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's really interesting. Do you have a place for readers or listeners to get in contact with you? Do you have like a public facing website or anything like that? So it's Ian Townsend, all one word. So I-A-N-T-O-W-N-S-E-N-D, Ian Townsend dot com dot au so it's in townsend dot com dot au and the the dot au for australia at the end is important <laughs> um, right and, that, and, that, and that'll find my that'll find my website and you can there's a there's a link you can send me an email there yeah i'd love to hear from people okay all right wonderful i'm looking forward to that and i'll definitely stay in touch and watch for your next book as well do you have a title for that one already i've got some working titles i don't, I don't uh, want to jinx I'm it if you don't to... want to talk about it yeah that's no problem at all <laughs> No, no, I was thinking of a nice title, you know. It involves actually one of the one of the great espionage figures. Kare actually used him as Carla mm, in one of his yeah. novels. Um, and this guy's called Philip Kislitson, who arranged the defections of Donald McLean and Guy Burgess from the UK. And so he was sent to Australia to sort out the spy rings here and Moya had a few confrontations with him. So so I'm thinking of calling the book The Man in the Panama Hat because Kislitson used to wear Panama hats. Good. Yeah, that's an intriguing title for sure. I like it. Yeah, but anyway, I'll see what happens. Great. Well, thank you so much, Ian. The book is called Line of Fire by Ian Townsend. If you want to pick it up, I'll put some links to it on my own social media pages after this episode comes out. But a worthy read for sure. This is an amazing story about Vicky and Ted and Marjorie and what happened there at Rabal, which has largely been forgotten until Ian came along. So make sure you pick that up as well. It's it's very rewarding read for sure. Thank you so much for joining us, Ian. Thanks, Justin. If you're interested in more of Spycraft 101, look for my page on Instagram at Spycraft 101 or connect with me on Patreon. My patrons get exclusive access to long form blog posts that dive deep into some of the most amazing stories in the history of espionage and receive free or discounted books and products from the Spycraft 101 store. That includes a free PDF copy of my own book, Spy Shots Volume 1, 101 True Tales from the World of Espionage. I want to say a big thank you to all of my patrons, including Stephen S. and Keith F., with your support, I've been able to continue funding my research and publication across multiple platforms to date. Thank you all for listening, and I hope you'll stick around because there's lots more to come. Thanks for listening to this program brought to you by Daydreamer Network. If you enjoyed the episode, please don't forget to rate and review on Apple Podcasts or your preferred platform. Your feedback allows us to rank on the best new shows list and continue to grow our podcasts in order to bring more unique and talented storytellers to the network. To check out our shows, including programs about relationships, sports, business, nutrition, leisure, and more, head to www.daydreamernetwork.com. We look forward to seeing you back next week for another great episode. Have a wonderful day.